You're listening to FOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good morning and welcome to FOJC Radio Church. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper and when two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us and here's Brother David. Good morning and welcome to the October 11th, 2015 edition of FOJC Radio Church. I am David Carey Cohen for the next hour or so. We're going to be studying the Word of God. So glad to have you aboard this morning. And at the top of the broadcast this morning, there's another persecution event that we're going to make mention of this morning. Uh, Last week we made mention, of course, of the shooting in Oregon, which the president is trying to exploit for his Luciferian gun grab, hard telling what he's going to try to pull to go around Congress with that, but there's something else that we need to mention this morning, and maybe some of you heard about it in the mainstream media. I didn't hear a word about this in the mainstream media, and I didn't, of course, hear a word about it from any of the squat to pee Christian leaders, except for one, credit where credit is due. I heard Donnie Swagger. Uh, mention this and absolutely rebuke the cowardly pastors and our apostate government, so credit where credit is due. But there's an article in the Daily Mail that uh, just has an account. It's dated uh, October, Thursday, October the 8th, and it's just a horrific account of uh, you know these uh, Islamists are just subhuman scum there's not words to express the there's not adjectives in the human language to call these people as low and as evil as what they are but there's an account here of a 12, 12 year old boy from Syria and they his father was there and two other men and uh, they had a group of Christians that they had captured and this 12 year old boy they chopped his fingers off in front of his father to try to get his father to renounce the Lord and they would not do it Uh, they executed 12 people they raped three women in front of them and then they executed the women and then they crucified the 12 year old boy and they crucified three other Christians there. And they were shouting the name Jesus as they were killing them and crucifying them. And it's just beyond description, the horrific evil that is being perpetrated. And what's even more horrific is the deadly silence from our government, um, if a, if a professional athlete says that he's a homosexual, President Obama will call him on the phone to congratulate him. Not a word about this. Not a word. And certainly not a word from the squat to pee Christian leaders. And uh, it, it just shows the unbelievable place that we are at. And certainly I believe that October is the month where we need to be much in prayer about this persecution that's coming on the land because Satan knows that the American church, that he can go through it like uh, a hot knife through butter, that it's already bowed the knee, there's no fight in it, and uh, we're, we're just on the verge of being absolutely decimated. So we need to be very much in prayer and we need to arm ourselves and examine as we've taught and urged that we do indeed have the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. So our lesson this morning, we're going to be dealing with a lesson that is going to be dealing with a lot of visuals. This would be a very good day if you're at all able to go into the chat because we've got a lot of 
pictures below the chat that we're going to be referring to that are going to, you know, uh, every picture tells a story, as Rod Stewart said, and uh, a picture is indeed worth a thousand words, and we're going to be using some visuals that are going to really enhance and bring alive this lesson for you this morning, pulling down the pillars. So, as we do, we're going to prepare our hearts this morning with a time of worship and prayer to prepare ourselves to receive the Word of God. And we'll be back in just a moment with our lesson this morning, Pulling Down the Pillars. We're sorry, but because of the YouTube rules, we cannot use my music in these recordings for YouTube. However, if you want to hear the message in its entirety with my music, you can go to our archives, use the same number, and hear the music and David's teachings. Thank you. Here's Brother David. Praise the Lord. We have um, a lot of requests this morning that we've received and we've prayed about this week. Um, have a request from someone that I went to high school with that is uh, someone we're going to be talking with and hopefully being able to minister to. A um, lot of other requests. One request that I can really sympathize with is uh, one of our listeners is having problems with people that are causing noise and keeping them awake. Now of all the things that can just want me to go drive me to the point of being postal being a third shift person is when people keep me awake with nonsense when i'm trying to sleep and i'm thinking of all the things i gotta get done and one of the most aggravating things in the world for me but the lord's able to help us keep it between the ditches and uh walk through this thing so let's go to the lord in prayer this morning heavenly father we do thank you for the great god that you are we know that nothing that's going on takes you by surprise doesn't surprise you a bit that you are in control and lord that you have your hand upon your people this morning we thank you for that and father we just pray for all of our listeners this morning that you just give them that special touch in this perilous time that they'll feel the touch of your grace and power that we might serve you in these last days father we just pray for a supernatural move of the spirit of god that will accomplish what only that can do and father we just pray this morning that as we open your word that you'll just speak to us this morning that you'll strengthen us. Help me this morning to bring forth your word in clarity and anointing. And help Donna this morning to keep everything running smoothly. And we truly give you the praise for everything good that happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's turn to the book of Judges, chapter 16. And we're going to talk about Samson again this morning. And I hope that after this series on Samson that you'll always think about him just a little bit differently perhaps than you did before but we want to go to the book of judges and our lesson this morning is pulling down the pillars let's read in judges chapter 16 and beginning in verse 22 how be it the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven and the hair was the symbol of Samson's consecration to God, the symbol of that Nazarite vow. And Samson's power was in the fact that he walked with God. He walked with God like Enoch walked with God. And he was not really a very good Nazarite sometimes. There was the time when he touched the dead carcass of the lion to bring out the honey. A strict Nazarite could not have touched the carcass of a dead animal. And then there was the time when he went down to Timnath and he married the Philistine woman. His father had a fit, you know. You sh what are you marrying a Philistine for? But in Judges chapter 16 verse 4, said his father did not know that it was of the Lord. Samson was obeying the Lord and he'd done some things that were very unorthodox. That's what the Lord wants now. Some people that will think outside the box and 
follow him in ways that to people seem unorthodox, but it's really, really not. Now, in verse 23, it says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god, and to rejoice, for they said, Our god hath delivered Samson our enemy into our hand. And Dagon was the god that was a Nephilim half-breed. It was half-fish and half-human. And the Pope, we've showed this before, the Pope has the mitre of Dagon upon his head. And if you ever look at the little Pope's hat, it's a fish mouth being opened. This is the, the mitre of Dagon upon the Pope's head. Now in verse 24, it says, And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy, and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson, that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport, and they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were all upon the roof about three thousand men and women that beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember him. I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. Now, such a profound picture here. Uh, anyone that's familiar with Freemasonry understands the two middle pillars of Jachin and Boaz and of the right and the left and this is what the Baphomet signifies the right hand and the left hand path now here we have the Lord using Samson with his left and right hand destroying that which Satan has built and uh, in verse 30 it says, And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Then his brethren on all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtol in the burying place of Manoah his father. And he judged Israel twenty years. Now, if you will please go down below the chat to picture number two. And there's something that took place this week that we want to take a look at and say just a little bit about. Now, what you're seeing is the picture of the ancient arch and temple of Palmyrus in Syria. Now, this was destroyed this week. The arch was destroyed and uh, much of this temple and two others by the ISIS militants. Um, I have a article here from uh, USA Today this week, October 6th, and it says, Islamic State's latest victim, the arch in ancient Syrian city. And this is what you're looking at here in picture number two. And it says here that uh, this was in the USA Today article, it says that dated from the year 100 A.D., and it says the Islamic State also destroyed the 2,000-year-old Temple of Bel, Palmyra's main temple, and the smaller temple of Baal Shamim, other ancient temples, and modern-day Islamic cemeteries and shrines. Now, there's nothing that illustrates anymore the role of Islam. And what we need to end, this illustrates, amazingly, Daniel chapter 11. And let's look at verse 37 and 38. And we've talked about this before. And a lot of people are saying and teaching that Islam will be the beast, and it will not. Islam is actually fighting against the beast. Because who's the beast? 
Hello, that's right, you've got it. Uh, it's us, folks. Now, Daniel chapter 11, verse 37 and 38. And it says here, Neither shall, and this is speaking of the willful king. The willful king is different from the first beast of Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, we've got number one, a military beast, and number two is a religious beast. Now, Daniel 11.37, speaking of the willful king, who, and this is, uh, I believe this is Iran, and it certainly would include ISIS and this move we're seeing right now. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. You see, the God of the fathers of this land is right here. It's this temple. Of in Palmyra. It's the temple to Baal Sharem and to the gods of the mysteries. He, he won't regard it. He hates it. He's destroying these temples of the god of the mysteries. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers nor the desire of women. The desire of women is specifically the goddess that was worshipped as Astarte in Freemasonry, that is worshipped as Mary the Queen of Heaven in Roman Catholicism. And this fellow hates these things, which he obviously does. This is what we're seeing. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor to the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate he shall honor the God of forces, the God of war and military might. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. And this is what we're seeing unfold before our eyes. We're seeing this move in this land rising up against the ancient gods that were once their worship. Now, if you will look, if you will please, at picture number three. Here is a... Um, picture of something in Nashville, Tennessee. And this is the Parthenon. It's a, it's a reproduction of the Parthenon. And by the side of this, you see the statue of the goddess Athena. Uh, the original name was the goddess Pales, uh, in, uh, from which we have the word Parthenon. And this is an example of what is called Palladium architecture. And here immediately we get a connection with Palladium Freemasonry. And we're going to understand that after this morning like never before. And if you will look at the picture here of this goddess. This is in Nashville, Tennessee. And look at the man standing at the foot of this goddess. And this is just about what a real life size first generation Nephilim would have been like. Uh, these rascals were literally 40 to 50 feet tall or bigger. And uh, this is like first generation Nephilim here. And uh, this Palladium architecture, it, we're going to learn a new word this morning that I think is probably new to most of you. It's called Parthenogenesis. And as we have explained and talked about before, that in the mystery religions... And in the ancient cultures of the Greek and Romans, the highest learning that was attainable was what they called the study of theology. Now, this is what we would call mythology. And today, the, the mythology is just looked upon as superstition, and this is intentional, because mythology is the pure Luciferian doctrine. And in mythology, there's a word called Parthenogenesis. Now, this comes from the word Parthenon and Genesis. Uh, and literally, the word Partheno is virgin, and Genesis means source or origin of. And Parthenogenesis was the word that they used that the goddess was capable of bringing forth life without fertilization. And of course, this is the original concept of of the women bringing forth through the aid of the sexual union of fallen angels. Now, according to their mythology, 
after the parthogenesis of Eve, the pillars were put in place to separate the heaven from the earth. So here on the Parthenon and on all of these Palladium architectures, these temples, the, the columns represent the separation that came about when Eve fell. But there's two different interpretations. When the Bible says when Eve fell that it was a bad thing. But in the Luciferian genre, the fall of Eve was a good thing. So we're going we're gonna to keep that in mind as we go through. But let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And when we look at these, we understand that those columns in that architecture, that it represents the separation between the heaven and the earth. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 3. And let's read the fall of man. And then we're going to understand that there are two interpretations of the fall of man. One is the biblical interpretation. And the other is the Luciferian interpretation that is presented through Freemasonry and their Masonic symbols and the symbols that are in the architecture. And this Palladium architecture is... Uh, you're going to really see this by the time we unpack this a little bit. And also, this is interpreted in the heavens. And we're going to look at how this is interpreted as per the constellations in also a good and bad way. So there's some very profound things here. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made, and said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, what we need to understand here, as this serpent at this time was not a little crawly snake, that this serpent was a creature, and we can show, probably, hopefully, before we'll get time to get to this this morning, but I'll show you exactly what the serpent was. The serpent was an animal. It was not a snake. And it was uh, more subtle than any beast of the field. It even had powers of speech. And uh, Eve was not surprised when this serpent spoke. So, And we can show biblically just exactly what it was. And we need to understand that the serpent didn't crawl on its belly until after the curse. But... We'll hold that for just a moment. In verse 2, it says, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now here in verse 3, Eve really started something. She added to the word of God. She added the words, Neither shall ye touch it. Now, once we begin adding to the Word of God, the next step is, in verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. After Eve added to the Word of God, it was easy for Satan to deny the Word of God and to get the woman to agree in denying the Word of God. Now, whenever you add to the Word of God, and we were talking about last week, that it is not obedience to God unless you're doing something God commanded. When you add to, oh, I want to celebrate the birthday of Jesus on December 25th. There's nothing commanded about that. So if you want to add that to it and you obey it, you're just obeying your own carnal commandments. You're not obeying God because God didn't command it. Command it. And if you want to say that uh, Rick Warren's purpose driven life is the answer for your sin problem. Well, God didn't say that. God said the cross was the answer for your sin problem. So if you add that in, uh, that's not obedience and it's not going to help you one bit. So this is how it goes. Adding to the Word of God leads to a denial of the Word of God and it just opens the door for Satan as it did right here. 
For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And this is one of the most misread scriptures uh, in the Bible. And usually when Genesis 3, 5 is quoted, it says that uh, preachers will say that Satan told Eve that she could be like God. And it does not say that. It says, ye shall be as gods, literally the Elohims. And when the Bible uses gods, little g, plural, it's talking about the fallen angels, not about uh, God himself. Now, I want to read something from a Freemason by the name of Lynn Perkins. And this book is called Masonry in the New Age. Lynn Perkins' books uh, published in the McCoy, McCoy Masonic Catalog. And on page 100 of this book, and Masonry in the New Age. Now that should be a clue for you. The Scottish Rite Journal uh, for years was called the New Age Magazine. But this is what Mr. Perkins says on page 100. He says, The serpent gave to Eve this advice or counsel. The serpent gave to Eve this advice or counsel was, it seems to me, wiser than the recorded command of God that would have, if obeyed, confined Adam and Eve and their descendants to the status of animals forever. Now, this is the way Lucifer, and I could read quotes like this also from Mormonism. Mormonism also teaches that uh, the fall of man was a good thing, that it opened up the path to godhood and, of course, celestial sex, which is uh, what Mormonism is all about. Freemasonry and Mormonism, they're just pagan sex cults. That's what they are. Now, this is uh, what the columns represent. And when you see the Parthenon and you see the columns, this represents the separation that took place when Eve fell. Now, according to the true interpretation, the Lord would send a Savior, virgin born to the seed of the woman, to redeem mankind and build the true temple of the people of God. But in this Masonic temple, the Palladium Temple of Palladium Freemasonry, this is where they do the rituals to undo the separation by bringing back the fallen ones, you see. They say, well, boy, uh, it was a bad thing that this separation took place. We're going to bring them down again in this Palladium Temple. Now, if you will go down below again, let's look at a visual. Uh, let's look, uh, if you will, at picture number five. Now look here at Aleister Crowley and just back off and look what he's doing. He is doing the Masonic Temple, you see. Look at his arms. His arms are the columns and his hat is the pediment on top of the Palladian Temple. You see, right now we have people that are in churches that are believing their pre-trib rapture, they're looking for the rebuilt temple, and they don't realize that the temple is being built through this Masonic occult system, and it's being put right within their churches. They're literally not getting it. Now, go down here also to picture number eight. Now, here in picture number eight is a Masonic drawing. Now, here again, and a picture is worth a thousand words. And here again, we have the Baphomet goat coming to have his way with this woman in between the two columns, Jachin and Boaz. And this is what the Masonic temple, Palladium Freemasonry, and all paganism is about. It's bringing back the fallen ones to bring back that separation that God made. God made a separation and they want to undo the separation by bringing back that which God brought judgment on. Now, let's look at it uh, biblically. Let's look at 2 Peter 2, four, And it's just so obvious. And once you understand that this is what the columns represent, these symbols really begin to interpret themselves. 
uh, in Second Peter chapter two and verse four. And I'm in First Peter. That's not gonna work. Second Peter two and four. It says, "For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment." Now, God judged the fallen angels, and ever since he judged them and sent them to Tartarus. And in, in mythology, when the gods mated with human women, they brought forth the Titans. And in Greek mythology, the Titans were sent to Tartarus. So here is another explicit biblical connection here that lets us know that this is exactly how we're understanding it. Now also, if you'll go down and look at these pictures, picture number nine. Here we have the columns of Jachin and Boaz represented by the two men there. And in between we have the parallel lines, the columns, and we have the point within the circle. Now Albert Mackey, one of the along with Mr. Pike, one of the genuine Masonic authorities, wrote Mackey's Encyclopedia, he explicitly explains the point within the circle as the male and female genitalia. So once again, and of course the letter G in Freemasonry is stands for generation. And this is what it's all about. The parthogenesis, the generation of the goddess bringing back that which God did away with. And above it, blasphemously, above the point within the circle, and in every Masonic lodge, the Bible is placed, the Masonic Bible is placed above the point within the circle in every Freemasonic lodge. Blasphemy. And maybe these dingbat, lukewarm, cowardly, yellow stripe up the back pastors, maybe we need to have a vote on whether or not Freemasonry might be bad. You think? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's just like these churches that have, well, let's vote to see if homosexuality is a sin or not. you got to be kidding. If you got to vote about it, you're in trouble. Now, in, verse, in picture number 10 here, we also see another. We talked about this before. It's the woman weeping over the broken column. And here, of course, when you understand the symbolism... The uh, the pillar was destroyed and the separation was made between the heaven and the earth and these fallen ones were driven out. And of course this woman's weeping about it. And uh, here this little strange guy is coming up behind her with his little wings. And every picture does indeed tell a story. And Ms. Mason specifically explained this symbol as the goddess Astarte. And this goes back to the symbolism of the woman weeping for Tammuz. And here we have the original story of the dying god, who is Hiram Abiff. And this, the beast of Revelation 13, he will be the god. And this is what the head wounds mean in Revelation 13. We're not looking about a resurrection event, but he will profess to be the god that died and it came back to life, the God of the mysteries, the opponent of Jesus Christ. So you see, this is what Isis is fighting about. This was the worship that took place in this temple in Pi Palmyra. It was the worship of the dying God. And uh, this is what Isis is out to destroy. And in this chaos that Isis is perpetrating, we're going to see come forth the rise of beast number one, the military beast, and beast number two, the religious beast, who will be Papa the Pope. Now, we're going to take a break this morning, and then we're going to come back so much more. We've got to talk about this morning, and when we come back, we're going to go airborne. And we're going to explain to you the understanding of how all of this was interpreted through the constellations. We'll be right back. F-O-J-C Radio, where you 
are on the fringe of your Holy Ghost encounter. You're listening to FOJC Radio, where truth in the Word of God is found. Welcome back, and we just are so thankful to have you spending this time studying the Word of God this morning. These are serious times, and we appreciate people that are serious students of the Word of God, and we certainly appreciate appreciate that this morning. Now, we want to go to Genesis chapter 3 verse 14. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 14. And this speaks of the curse that was brought upon the serpent. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And the curse upon Satan and the fall of man brought down the column, spiritually speaking. And, of course, in Samson, we see him destroying the Luciferian pillars. And at this point of pulling down the pillars, the people of God are set against the people of Satan. We see here the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent in direct conflict. And it's right here at the point of the pulling down of the pillars. Now, it's also interesting that 3.14, this is what is called pi. In mathematics, this is the ratio of the radius and the circumference of a circle. Now, This is the mathematical calculation that is needed to build these enormous structures. Like, in architects can tell you that in the Great Pyramid, pi was used in the construction of this, and at that time they didn't believe that pi was even discovered for many years. And also in the Great Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico, they also knew the calculation of pi. So that's a little interesting aside there. But in verse 15, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And, of course, the godly interpretation is that on Calvary's cross, which crushed the head of Satan, that the heel of Christ was bruised and also we are the body of Christ and we in the great tribulation are going to undergo a pounding by Satan but we will come through that also victorious now I want you to go if you will to picture number one and this is a picture of the constellations And for our new listeners, I'm going to read Psalm 19 and 1. We've talked about these things several times. But in the 19th Psalm, and for thousands of years, the we said uh, in, in this study that before the flood, we know that there was the book of Enoch and there was the book of Job. Uh, other than that, we don't know that were, there were any books and that these were not, or, or at least books that were, you know, scripture or godly books for edification there perhaps were but we don't know of them but the main method of communication was through the stars and in psalms 19 and 1 it says the heavens declare the glory of god and the firmament sheweth his handiwork day unto day uttereth speech and night unto night showeth knowledge there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard And the reason why is because God used symbols. And these symbols were interpreted by the godly remnant in a godly way to look forth to the Messiah that would one day come. And by the the Luciferians, they had their own interpretation. Now, let's just look at this. And if you'll look here 
uh, you see the woman, the lion, the crab, and the serpent. And the woman is the constellation Virgo. And of course, in Genesis 3.15, the woman would bring forth the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is over uh, the serpent, Hydra, and he is getting ready to devour the crab, which is a, uh, a symbol of the beast and uh, the Antichrist, if you will, that will come. Now, there is, uh, it's, these are, the woman is very readily understood, the, the virgin-born Messiah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is real obvious, over the serpent, this is real plain. Now, the crab, there is not a direct reference in the Word of God to the crab, but there is a reference, and this is so cool. You're going to love this. Let's go to the book of Jude, the third and fourth verses, and here we're going to see the crab, and we're going to understand very much the symbolism of this crab and how it represents the beast and these little Antichrist teachers. Now, in the book of Jude, verse 3 and 4, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord, the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the word there we want to look at is the word crept. This is number 3921 in your Strong's. It's paris duno. Paris duno. And this word literally means to settle in alongside to lodge stealthily or to creep in unawares. And literally what this word means is to enter sideways. To enter sideways. Now, for those of you that have ever watched a crab walk, crabs are the only animal that do not walk forward. The crab walks sideways. And this word, paris duno, it describes the movement of the crab. They move sideways. And that's literally what the Lord is saying about these teachers that they moved in sideways. And here we see the crab creeping in sideways, coming in. And of course, the faith once delivered to the saints this was delivered by our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have these Antichrist teachers coming in sideways into the body. Now, let's look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to understand just exactly what happened and just exactly what is happening now and uh, just exactly what's getting ready to happen. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19, it says, Little children, it is the last time, and ye have heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, the Antichrist, anti means in place of. Jude talked about the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, which was delivered by Jesus Christ. Then here come these little crabby teachers. They come in sideways, and they bring in something in place of what Jesus taught. Now, in Revelation 13, there are two beasts mentioned. There's a... Uh, military beast and a religious beast, per se. And neither one is called the Antichrist. And here, the word Antichrist, it's applied not to the military aspect of this, but to the religious aspect. That which is called Antichrist is that 
which is taught in place of the doctrine of Christ, which Jesus once delivered unto the church. So if we would call either of the beast in Revelation chapter 2 Antichrist, we would properly call the second beast or the Pope the Antichrist because he is the one which brings in that which is in place of Jesus Christ. Him and all of these other little crabby guys that have come into the church. Now here's something else in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 that there is a progression. There is the creeping in and then there is the sitting down in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. The scripture says this, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So it begins with the creeping in. And after they creep in, and after they are accepted and not rejected by the body, they then set down. And this is where we're at. People are sitting in their churches. They're waiting for the rapture. And they're looking for a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem for the Antichrist, who they think is the military leader, to come in and sit down. And already these little crabby guys have come in sideways, they have crept in, they have sat down, and they, have, they are proclaiming within the temple of the living God, they are showing themselves to be God by replacing that when the Lord has taught. And it's just an amazing, the, the devil has certainly done a good job. And of course, if you take what Jesus said in his doctrine, there's no way you're going to come up with this pre-trib rapture doctrine. You're not going to come up with a literal thousand-year reign doctrine. You're, and what did Jesus say? That he would destroy this temple and build it again in three days. And he says, this spake he of his body. You see? When you, when you look at the doctrine of Christ, you see, it all, it all gets back to this, which we said, you either take what God said or you add to it. And the minute you add to it, you've just added to it. And you see, the thing about Samson, Samson walked with God. And you will never be able to properly evaluate the thoughts of men and the things that men do until you walk with God. When you begin to walk with God, you see the thoughts and the plans of men for just what they are. They are nothing and less than nothing. And this is where God's remnant will stand. They will stand in between the pillars. And you will either pull them down or you will grab hold of them and embrace them. There's no middle ground. This is the thing about Samson. There is no compromise here. You either pull it down or you embrace it. Now, after the creeping in and after the setting down, there's something else that takes place. Now, let's look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 And in Romans chapter 11, there's a very, very solemn thing that the Lord says here through the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 11, verse 22 and 23. He says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, meaning the Jews, severity, but toward thee goodness, meaning the, the Gentiles. If thou continue in his goodness, Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. Now, notice the, the comparison here. The Jews were cut off in judgment. The Gentiles were grafted in. And they will continue, if they continue in faith, the faith once delivered to the saints. But if not, thou also shalt be cut off. 
And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And this is the prophetic moment that we're standing in. We are seeing the cutting off of the Gentile church. And in in the book of Revelation, it talked about the removing of the, the candlesticks. And we were studying in our other lessons on Samson about how Ichabod that when Phineas in the time of Samson, when Phineas's wife gave birth, that the child was named Ichabod, meaning the glory is departed. And we're come to that place where Ichabod has been written above the doors. They have already been cut off. And if anything could be any more obvious, today in America, the churches have more money and more people are attending churches in America today than ever before. And it is absolutely cut off and powerless. Our nation has never been any deeper into the sewer. The more money and the more numbers and the more power they get, the deeper into the satanic sewer our nation sinks. There has been the cutting off of this apostate Gentile church as any kind of a voice for God. And what we're seeing amazingly, this week, Bebe Netanyahu, in a speech, made reference specifically to the growing and significant Christian community in Israel. There has not since the first century been a the number of Christians in Israel, the Jews coming to the Lord, that there ever has been. And we are in this precise moment, the cutting off, and we're seeing Israel and, and ethnic Jews, and we're seeing, and of course, all Israel shall be saved. It refers to all of the saved Jews plus all of the saved Gentiles. We're not talking about an ethnic thing. But yet we're seeing this profound prophetic moment and, and we're living it and we're watching it. And for they, those that have eyes to see, they can surely see this thing. Now, I want to look at Judges chapter 16 and verse 23, and I want to direct your attention again down below the chat to, uh, I think I believe this is the last picture that we, we have not talked about, that of Atlas. Now, in Judges chapter 16 and verse 23, we notice the temple that was being worshipped in. In Judges chapter 16, verse 23, it says, Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their god. Now, in mythology, guess who Dagon's brother was? Dagon's brother was Atlas. And if, if you look here, at picture number six, here we have the picture of Atlas holding up the heavens. And of course, this is again talking about the separation between the heaven and the earth and how that once again they seek to reestablish the connection by bringing back down the fallen ones. And of course, Revelation 9. This talks about the fallen ones come back. And look at this picture of Atlas holding up the world. Look at this picture of the world. What do you see right above him? There is the crab. So you see, they are very, very aware of the interpretation of this as it is interpreted not only in mythology, not only in architecture, not only in symbolism, but also in the constellations. Now, I hate to say it, but my goodness, the rock, Dwayne Johnson, has been used by the devil. Have you seen the new movie about Hercules with Dwayne the Rock Johnson? And this is all in there. If you watch this movie, you, you can see the whole thing here. And we're not even going to be able to get into the all the symbolism of the slaying of the dragon and all of that. We might have to come back for one more Samson lesson because there's just so much here. I mean, this literally epitomizes the... And, and no wonder that Samson has been so looked over and just dismissed as kind of uh, ignorant boob, so to speak. Uh, 
because nobody like Samson represents God's end time remnant that will pull down the pillars and fight without compromise this Luciferian Masonic system. But the, there's just so much, and we didn't get to tell you what the serpent was, but we, we just aren't going to have time this morning to get all this in. So I, we're just going to have to come back for one more run at Samson to tie all this together. But these things are literally unfolding before our eyes. And it's certainly a time for God's people to be much in prayer and to be much aware of what's going on. Because the Lord is going to use His people to pull down these pillars and to rescue people out of the fires of hell. But we just want to say once again that we're just so thankful for those of you that study with us this morning. And we just want to close out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for that which you've done for us, for enabling us to be together this morning. Lord, we just pray that you'll just quicken our spirits to see and understand that which is happening around us. And Father, we just pray a special blessing of wisdom and revelation and protection upon each and every one listening this morning. And we give you the praise for everything good that happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. And we will see you next week on FOJC Radio Church. God bless you all. Thank you for being a part of FOJC Radio Church. You can contact us at FOJC, Post Office Box 4174, Evansville, Indiana, 47724-4174. Or you can call us at area code 812-473-3735. Or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com. Or you can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com. When you get there, all you have to do to listen to our auto DJ that runs 24 hours a day is to click on the radio page. If you'd like to listen when we're live, that's Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Central Time, we have FOJC Radio Church. During the radio church, we have several people that join in the chat room, and I also post the scriptures that David is teaching about uh, right in the chat room. So please come and join us. And then if you'd like to listen to other archives, uh, just uh, go to our main page, click on the archives button, and you can choose from many recordings that we've already uh, put on for shared. All you have to do is sign up free uh, through for shared. It's a very simple process. But if you have any trouble, just contact us and we'll help you. Thank you for listening. And please check out this channel because there will be more videos to come. Thank you for your patience and thank you for listening. God bless.